أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفر ونعود بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يحتح الله أحوى المحتد ومن يضل الفلاح ديلا أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله Dear brothers and sisters, all the praise and glory belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We thank Him. We seek His guidance and ask for His forgiveness. We seek refuge with Allah from the sins and evil of our souls. Whom Allah guides, no one can lead astray. Who Allah leads astray will find no guidance. I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam I bear witness that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his uh, servant and messenger. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu attaqullah haqqa tuqatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimoon. O you who believe, be conscious of Allah and do not die except as Muslims. يا أيها الذين آمنوا كونوا قوامين لله شهداء بالكسط ولا يجرمنكم سنآن قوم على أن لا تعدلوا ويعدلوا هو أقرب للتقوى واتقوا الله إن الله خبير بما تعملون O you who believe, stand firmly with Allah as witness to fair dealing and let not the hatred of others make you commit wrong and move away from justice. Be just that is next to piety, fear Allah for Allah is well aware of what you do. Dear brothers and sisters, the topic for today's khutbah is accountability and the quest of our destiny. Let me explain to you what I mean by this topic, why I chose it, and share some insights that I have for today, inshallah. I want this to be an inspirational that motivates us in the right direction, inshallah. Many of what I say may be familiar to you. Accountability is about the human behavior to not abdicate our responsibility and that we never give up in the face of difficulties. Accountability is usually not a problem when we, things are going good. Accountability becomes a problem when we face challenges. Challenges of personal nature, challenges that we face as a community. For example, in the personal realm, all of us go through our careers get to a point where we want to, we feel like we are stuck, we need to move, find something that is better, that inspires us. We make an attempt and then we give up because we are not seeing what we need. A personal challenge would be a lifestyle change where we want to live a healthy lifestyle, exercise. We get up, look out of the window, it's raining, it's cold, it's winter, we decide, let's wait for six months until the summer comes. A community challenge could be the challenges that we face as a community. It may seem so overwhelming that we come to the conclusion that there's nothing we can do that is going to materially change. We decide we don't do anything. I was looking at the statistic of number of Muslims that register to oath. The last data that I found was from 2011, right after 9-11, and less than about 50% of the Muslims eligible to oath don't even register to oath because we think that there's not a whole lot of impact that we can make in the society. The second component of my khutbah is the quest of our destiny. By that I mean we don't let others define who we are. We always have a point of view as to what we want and, and show it through our actions. 
We live in a time around the elections that we are being marginalized. We're being called names, terrorists. Not, we are told that you can't come to the country by certain politicians. We make it clear that we don't buy into this. This is not the time to stay passive. We stand up and say what we believe in. Our conviction is not just through actions, not through, just through words, but through actions, by proving to the community that we live in, that we are an integral part and we are very much committed to the society that we live in. And the best example that we have in this regard is no other than a Prophet and that what comes to my mind today is all that you know, if you know the conversation between Prophet ﷺ and Abu Talib in his deathbed. That he, Abu Talib approached Prophet ﷺ at the request of the people of Mecca and asked Prophet ﷺ to give up his mission for his own safety. To which Prophet ﷺ said, Oh uncle, if you place sun in my right hand and moon in my left hand to force me to renounce my mission, I will not. Either I will, I will be successful by the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or I will perish striving for it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reinforces this in the Quran in the verses that I'm going to recite, inshallah. أَذْ بِلَا مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُغَيَّرُ مَا بِي قَوْمٍ حَتَّى يُغَيَّرُ مَا بِي أَنفُسِهِمْ Indeed, Allah will not change the condition of a people until they change what is in themselves. Indeed, Allah does not change the condition of the people until they change what is in themselves. Further, Allah says, we are, account, account, we are accountable for everything that we do. Allah says in the Quran, Then shall anyone who has done an atom's worth of good will see it. Then anyone who has done an atom's worth of evil will see it. Further, he says in the Quran, وَلَا يَزِرُوا وَازِرَةً وِزْرَ أُحْرَى وَإِنْ إِذْعُوا مُثْقَلَةٌ إِلَىٰ حِمْلِهَا Nor can one bear the burden of another, even if he is heavily burdened, and call upon another to bear his load. Allah is indeed merciful, for He says, لَا يُكَلِّفُ نَفْسًا إِلَّا أُسْأَحَا no soul or no soul does Allah place a burden more than it can bear. It gets every good that it earns and it suffers every ill that it earns. When Allah talks about the blessings that He has showered on the human beings in Surah Ar Rahman, He reminds us every time by saying, which of the favors of your Lord will you deny? For bi ayy ala yirabbi kama tu kathiban. This topic actually was inspired to me by two things that happened recently. About two weeks ago, Brother Allah gave a khutbah on the topic of things are not what they appear to be, in which he talked about two, two things. In spite of all the, the, the bad things, evil things, the sufferings that Muslims may face all over the world. We have to have the conviction that Allah is ultimately in charge and control of what is happening. Secondarily, second thing he talked about was that we have to believe that finally we would have the glad tidings. Things will change. And using the example of Surah Al-Kahf, he talked about this topic. After the khutbah, he and I had a chance to talk and we sort of felt that you know while the topic is important it felt as if that that we have a no role to play in changing that condition we talked about the fact that there has to be a role that we play in impacting the environment 
the situation that we face and agreed that he didn't have the time to address it and, and, and asked me to address it as part continuation of the message that he gave. The second thing that inspired me to, to, do, to take on this topic is my recent visit to, uh, to Poland. I had a chance to visit Warsaw three weeks ago and every place that I go to, I make it a point to learn the history, the culture of the people. And it's amazingly, I've had to been to a number of countries, number of cities, and I find there's amazing learning that we can learn from every, every part of the world. For those of you who know, Poland suffered at most in World War II. Poland was the first country to be invaded by the Nazis in 1939 and was the last country where the Nazis were driven out of before the end of the World War II. So for five years they suffered innumerable amount of sufferings. 90% of the Warsaw, city of Warsaw was destroyed. About a sixth of the people of the Poles were killed, about 5.1 million people. As I was walking through the streets of Poland, the guy, the tour guide, pointed to me at the, at the buildings and said, Haider, do you know what is underneath these buildings? These are live ammunitions that are buried. I asked him why. The amount of ammunition that was thrown in Warsaw was so much that using the methods that was available at the time, it would have taken them 50 years to clear those mines, those ammunitions. They decided to just build on top of it. And what is more difficult is that after five years of suffering, it was replaced with 45 years of communism. It reminded me of what is going on in Aleppo, in Syria today. And yet, if you go today, you will see a different country. Before I go there, I also had a chance to go to Auschwitz, which is a concentration camp that is one of the concentration camps that Nazis put in place. If you have a chance, you should go there. I've never seen a killing of human beings done for a more than a year, like assembly plant, systematically being killed day after day, like as if you're processing, you know, screwdrivers or processing manufacturing thing through an assembly line. It's there for us to see today. And yet, if you go today and look at where Poland stands, if you look at the GDP of Poland, it's one of the top 25 countries more so than any Muslim country besides Saudi Arabia, which gets its GDP through oil, natural resources, and Indonesia, which has 10 times more population than Poland. It has more no Nobel laureates than Muslim countries. And if you look at the GDP of Poland since communists left in 1989, it has grown 10 times since the communists left Poland in 1989 to today. And it took the Poles to face these challenges to rebuild the country. And I'll give you one example. When the city was destroyed, they couldn't go to the communists to rebuild the city. They decided that the, they want to rebuild the city themselves, even though it is under an occupation of the Soviets. So a bunch of architects came together to see you know, if the orchid, if this arc plans for the city existed before the destruction, they got those plans. A number of architects refused to undertake the rebuilding because they didn't want to rebuild what in the same fashion what was there before. It's because it was against the ethics to rebuild what was there to pretend it was an older architecture. And yet a few prevailed and rebuilt the city to bring what was there before. The history, if you come back to the history of the Sira, it is all about the quest for the destiny. Not let others define the outcome. Not let define the prophet's mission. When he faced challenges, he told his companions to go to Abyssinia for first hijrah. When that didn't work out, he didn't stop there. He figured out how to preserve the mission and work with the people of Medina 
to establish, to migrate and, uh, and, and have this budding community grow in Medina. This is also the seerah of all of the prophets. They preserve in spite of the challenges. And one that I want to point out is that of Musa alayhi salam. What is the most important asset that prophets have? Their ability to communicate the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And here, Prophet Musa alayhi salam had a challenge because he was stammering and he, he raised his hands to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and made this prayer. Qala Rabbi sharahli sadri wa yassirli amri wa hulal uqdatam min lisani ifqahu qawli O my Lord, expand my breast, ease my task for me and lose a knot from my tongue that they may understand my saying. So it's not that we alone have challenges. People before us, the prophets, face similar challenges. When Allah talks about accountability, He talked about it at least eight times, the word hisab in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given all of us a plenty of ni'mah. That's why Prophet sallallahu said in the hadith, take the benefit of five things before five. Take your youth, before your old age, your youth before your old age, your health before your sickness, your wealth before your poverty, your free time before your preoccupation, before you get busy, and your life before your death. I address this to the youth who are here, that yes, you know, you have plenty of free time. Don't idle away your time just on your Xbox, on your mobile devices. Yes, you can have fun. But that's, don't make that as the primary reason why you want your weekends. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa barik Bismillah ar-Rahman 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 Alhamdulillah nahmaduhu wa nasta'ini wa nasta'afir Dear brothers and sisters, the topic for today's khutbah is accountability and the quest for our destiny. By accountability, I mean we don't abdicate our responsibility. We don't give up uh, our conviction. The quest of destiny by which I mean that we don't let others define who we are. We have a clear point of view on what defines us, what our values are, and we stand by it no matter what. And in this vein, I wanted to finish the khutbah with three things I want you to take away with some examples. The first one is confidence and conviction. When you're under pressure, when you're faced with challenges, the first casualty is the confidence. When you lose the confidence, when you lose conviction, then you don't have the strength. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَحِنُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا أَنْتُمُ الْعَوْلَوْنَ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ So lose not your heart, nor fall into despair, for you must overcome if you are true believers. Let me tell you another thing that inspired me, another event or a group of people, an organization that truly inspired me. This organization has probably fundraisers in this city every um, year or once or two years and they had their fundraiser here you know, a month ago or less than a month ago. Picture the year 1995. The place is Pakistan. The Soviet occupation has just, Afghanistan has just ended. Pakistan is in a terrible mess because of all of the arms and ammunition that has come in. The Taliban is just in control of Pakistan. School systems have been sort of almost collapsed, particularly in the frontier areas. And Pakistan has literally turned back I would say 25 to 50 years. A group of people, businessmen, successful businessmen, got together, decided what to do. 
what to do. Just like us. They could figure out how to get political power, how to change the politics. They knew that it was beyond their means. They decided strategically that they want to address the education, education of children, particularly in the areas, uh, frontier areas, border areas with Afghanistan, lawless areas. And they wanted to give not just mediocre education, they wanted to give them the best education any child anywhere can give in the most difficult part of the world. And there was born an organization called TCF, the Citizens Foundation. Today, they have over 1,200 schools and educate over a quarter of a million kids, giving them the best education anybody can, any child can get in the most difficult part of the world for nominal or no cost. And they're expanding very fast. And I had a chance to talk to the founder for a few minutes while he was here. And the, the thing, one thing that he said that really I will have it for the rest of my life. I know he said, you know, there's one thing that I have is I have optimism. I'm always an optimistic person, no matter what. I have the utmost optimism. And that's what inspires people to do this. If you don't feel that you can make a difference, you won't get involved into anything. The second thing I want to talk to you about is tenacity. Not being able, not giving up in the face of failure. And the example that I want to give you here is that of Thomas Edison, who invented incandescent lamp. You know, he tried to figure out the right filament. Most of you know this story. He tried like thousands of different filaments to make it work. They all failed. And it's funny that one of his, you know, his associates said, you know, all our work is in vain. We have learned nothing out of all of these experiments. To which Thomas Edison confidently replied, you know, we now know there are 2,000 elements which we cannot use to make a light bulb. And he also said, our greatest weakness lies in giving up. The most certain way to succeed is always try it just one more time. For sure, it worked for him. Think about tenacity. Think about Hudaybiya. You know, Prophet was in a very difficult situation. He had to negotiate. Even in the situation where he had to negotiate, his tenacity and his guidance for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made what would have been the worst, the most difficult situation into the most impactful decision that he had, impactful uh, action that he took. So much so that Montgomery Ward, a famous historian said, the single most thing that changed the course of Muslim history was the Hudaybiyah Accord because it removed any sense of rancor and opened the hearts of those people of Mecca to the message of Islam, which ultimately led to the Fatha Makkah. The last thing I want to talk to you about is strategic thinking, understanding our capabilities and taking an action based on what we are capable of doing. A lot of times we want to solve hard problems, great, but we have to understand what it is that strategically we can do for the short term and for long term and how can we make small, vic small victories turn into a big victory. And the best example, this is the month of Muharram. There's a lot of lessons we can learn from Hijrah. Prophet had a strategic alliance in secrecy with the people of Medina. 
To me, what is amazing about Hijra is his planning, his strategic thinking. He plans his vehicle in secret. He, need, he knows that his life is in peril. He has to have a guide that will take him safely. He finds a guide who is very good at his skill, but not a Muslim, teaching us that we find the right person for the right job. He goes south, even the Medina is north, to deceive people who are chasing him. As he is walking, on, going on his camel, he makes sure that there's a flock of sheep that is there so that they cannot find the footsteps. Think about the thinking that he had to go through. He didn't have cell phones. He didn't have text messages. And then he makes sure that in Asma bin Abi Bakr, the daughter of Abu Bakr, that she's bringing food wherever he's traveling so that he has food to eat, proving to him that the women have a role to play, that we cannot confine 50% of our ummah to be not part of the community. There's so much to be learned from the hijra. And finally, the beauty of this whole hijra was that in spite of all his planning, he had tawakkal in Allah, the trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That when the enemies showed up at the doorfront of the cave, he was at peace with himself, knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one that is going to save. I go back to South Africa, Nelson Mandela. You know, at one point in his, in his quest for freedom, he took a guerrilla approach to fight the apartheid because the oppression that the apartheid regime was imposing on South African blacks was so much that he felt he had to take a guerrilla warfare. But then when he had time to sort of negotiate, he realized that he has no sort of power to confront the force of the state and decided that negotiations was the right way to tackle the challenges that he faced to liberate, to break the apartheid and liberate South Africa of the apartheid. Today we face a lot of different issues as a community. Of last week, we heard this, we, over the weekend, we had the tapes of, of one of the presidential candidates. The question is, how do we deal with, with these issues with our children? Do we discuss this with our children? I had to make a painful decision with my 14-year-old son whether I'm going to talk about this or not. And I had to, because if we don't, they're talking among themselves. And we don't have a point of view on it. We have transgender issues. We have gays and lesbian issues that we face. We need to figure out the right way to deal with this. So in that light, inshallah in a month, we are having two great, two eminent scholars in this topic who is going to do a conference on Makashi the Sharia where they will discuss these topics and how to address this, equipping ourselves with the knowledge that we need so that we have confidence in dealing with this. So with this, inshallah, I close this khutbah praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he never ever uh, give us, put us in a situation, we abdicate a responsibility, we give up hope, and that we have confidence in what we believe in, and that he gives us the courage to take the message and take us the mission and demonstrate it through our actions. As somebody said, and if you want to know the real values that people hold, look at two things, look at their wallet, and look at the calendar, how you spend your time and how you spend your money. It tells you what our priorities are. We pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us to overcome the challenges we face, alleviate all the difficulties that we face, inshallah. We help us to improve the situation of all the Muslims, all of the people of the world who are going through pain and suffering. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless this community, bless all of the ummah, inshallah. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana. وفي الآخرة حسنة فكنا هذا بنار صلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم وسلم وفدنا الحمد لله رب العالمين وقم الصلاة